I just love seeing how excited people get because if you've never been to East Tennessee, you don't know what to expect. Being able to talk to them about the history, talk to them about the history of this area, um, being able to talk to them about the food that we make and how it connects to everything that's surrounding us. Um, whether it's things that are being foraged wild, whether it's the traditions of the types of food that people make here, and then what they're gonna sit down and eat in our restaurant and how those two things connect. There's a story behind everything that ends up on the plate. To be able to show someone, this is the farmer that made this. This is the hard work they put in. Now we're gonna take that product, we're gonna respect it, and we're gonna give it to you in a way that kind of shows you something about this area. There's nothing more special to me than going to the table and being able to present a beautiful piece of ham that was aged for three and a half years and say, this is what my family does. This is what my dad's grandfather did. This is what my parents do now. Um, being able to show people that and share that with them, uh, that's, th there's not many things I enjoy more about my job than that. Settled in the foothills of the Great Smoky Mountains, RT Lodge boasts one of the freshest menus you can find in East Tennessee. Chef Trevor Stockton has spent years building on the idea of what food means to him, its history, the relationships he cultivates, and the traditions of the Appalachian Mountains. When I was a kid, every year would come down to my great-grandfather's farm. My dad's whole family's from here. Thanksgiving and Easter break for school, uh, it was, me and my brother and my parents, plus my dad's three, four other siblings, their spouses, and their kids. And we would pack 20 of us into what at the time I thought was a giant farmhouse. And I recently went back and saw it, and I was like, how did we all fit in there? While it was just a cool place to hang out as a kid, um, there's things that, that stuck with me. You know, there's certain memories that you have. A lot of times those memories aren't just what you see, but kind of uh, the smells of things, right? Like. The smokehouse, uh, the, the can house was like one of the coolest things. You walk in there, dug into the side of the mountain, walk down in there, and it's all these jars of preserves, and there's hams hanging and all of that. Um, if we were having lunch, they would go grab food from the can house and then walk out to the garden and get greens. Um, but everything that we ate was coming from that farm. The very root of Southern cuisine is is that kind of vegetable-focused thing, you know? So many people who lived in Southern Appalachia, they grew gardens for subsistence, right? It wasn't just a hobby. And that's where a lot of, you know, the, the roots of Southern food come from, you know, those, those necessary gardens that putting things up for the winter, you know, uh, curing meat, that sort of thing. In the small town of Gainesboro, Tennessee, Trevor's parents have created life on the farm that looks a lot like how Trevor approaches his kitchen. The idea of giving back to their farming community and their family drives Jim and Kathleen Stockton to take great care in the methods they use. When I was basically a little, you know, as soon as I could walk, I could spend all my time here, you know? So I did that with my grandparents. So I learned from them everything. I owed them my life, actually. That's the way I feel. I actually, you know, like I said, I have two bulls, one named Willie, one named Morgan. You know, one grand, both grandfathers, they taught me a lot. One ran a dairy farm and the other ran beef and pigs and things like that. And they all, you know, so it's kind of nice where, and then the boys came along. So I was able, and they spent time with their great grandfather and stuff. So they spent all their time down here, just like I did. So they learned how to cure meats. They learned how to do all of that. And every one of us, we enjoy it. And the boys even, you know, Trevor even took it farther where he basically, he uses it all the time, as you know, with the charcuterie. But when I was a kid, you know, my dad was a chef, so I spent a lot of times in kitchens, um, just hanging out. Um, instead of getting a babysitter, I would just hang out in the kitchen. So between being in the kitchens with my dad and the experience that I had on the farm 
uh, in Tennessee. Uh, both of those things just kind of combined. Uh, this is all I've ever wanted to do. All I ever wanted to do is be a chef. Uh, when I first came to Tennessee and started cooking professionally, all of those memories from being a kid kind of came back like, okay, we don't see people cooking that way anymore. We don't, people, we don't see people living that way of life anymore. Uh, so how can, we, how can we work that into what we're doing in a nice setting? So I get a sense that there are no shortcuts in your kitchen, <laughs> even down to the fact that you're making your own charcuterie in-house. No, definitely no shortcuts. Um, if we can make it from scratch, if it's gonna improve the quality, we're gonna use it. My, my old chef, Rick, uh, taught me how to do a lot of fresh charcuterie because he worked in French kitchens, so like pâtés and sausages and things like that. Did as much research as I could about how things are done in the American South, how things are done in Italy, how things are done in Spain, how things are done in France. There's a little bit of each in there. I found the things that I thought worked for us, but um, what we have now, I think, is kind of our own, but... It's a part, where does the pork come from? Uh, pork's coming from my parents' farm. Uh, they have two different breeds. They've got okay. Berkshires and they've got uh, Mangalitsa pigs. Every time I get a pig from him, he um, he's sending me texts and calling me saying, Hey, uh, how's that pig looking? How's it look? I, I, this one I fed this at, for the last couple of weeks. This one, I did it different this way. So yeah, we're definitely working together uh, to figure out what works. And we've been doing this with pigs from their farm for eight, nine years now. Wait. So this is a piece of ham that's been aged for three and a half years. I mean, you can see the color on that. Like, it's not pale. It's not white. You know, they used to call pork the other white meat. It's not, it shouldn't be. If it's white, it's probably not a good piece of pork. I don't always get to talk to every guest that walks in the door, but when I do, like, presenting this to them and, and telling them that my parents raised this pig, that our team here broke this thing down and made a, a three and a half year aged ham, it, it's just something that most people don't get to experience every day anymore. Um, and so it's cool for me to be able to serve something like this. It's Honestly, the thing I'm most proud of is what we do here. Using traditional Appalachian flavors, Chef Trevor steps into the LG kitchen to bring an innovative taste of Tennessee to our guests. Trout is, is something that you're constantly working with. Is this a favorite at, at our tea lodge? It is. Uh, since we're in Tennessee, obviously we're not on the coast. Um, so we like to make sure that we're using a product that's coming from close by and not being shipped from, you know, hundreds or thousands of miles away. Uh, so first thing we're gonna do is get the sauce started. Okay. Um, the trout doesn't take long to cook at all, so we want to get our sauce going. Uh, we're going to basically make this Bur Blanc. It's a white wine butter sauce. Okay. So we're going to start with some white wine, and we're going to add shallots and black pepper to it and let that cook down. So we're just going to get the flavor of the shallot and black pepper into the wine. Uh, coming up with new dishes and the way that we cook, we very much cook with the seasons. You know, we can say farm sure. to table, we can, we can call it whatever we want, but essentially, uh, a lot of what we do is driven by the produce that's coming in the back door. So okay. we have, you know, a few different farms that we work with and they're bringing stuff in and some days they just bring things that they didn't even <laughs> tell me they would have, Yeah. Uh, which is fun. Um, that really does drive what we're going to put on the menu, what we're going to create. With this dish today, we've got some beautiful greens. Um, one comes from one farm, one comes from another farm, and then there's some watercress that we picked that's in the creek that runs through the woods by the lodge. That's so, awesome. Yeah. I need to make sure that I'm doing East Tennessee justice, right? So I want to make sure that what we're serving is a true representation of the area. Uh, even though I wasn't born there, I'm from Tennessee, my family's from Tennessee, and I really want to make sure that what we're doing represents it. Most people, they're going to catch their fish, they're going to build a little fire, they're going to cook it over the fire, and it's delicious, right? But why not introduce some other things? We've got the Benton's ham bits in there. Ellen Benton's the nicest man I've ever met in my life. They're 30 minutes down the road in Madisonville. Man's known all around the world for his hams. Let's put some of that in there. What I'm doing, my family did, and most rural people, they cured ham and bacon in their backyards. Well, they butchered their own pork, and it was a way of life. It was sustenance food. It certainly wasn't considered exotic or a luxury. <laughs> and we have managed somehow to get our foot inside the doors of great restaurants 
and most talented chefs like this fellow can. My grandparents were purely and simply sustenance farmers. They had little money. They raised everything they ate. But they took great pride in the quality of the pork that they made. And I've tried to honor that tradition. I, I used the original recipe that my family used, and I still make it the same way. And anything that we can do to figure out to make our product better, we're going to do it, no matter how expensive the process. We want to make the best product we know how to make. Now, I won't say that it's world class, but that's always been our goal. We want to make a world class product. So our sauce is done. Let's move to the star of the show, this yeah. East Tennessee Absolutely. trout. Absolutely. So we'll pull this off the heat, make sure it's not uh, not getting too warm. It's good to go. So now we're going to move on to our trout, right? So okay. uh, basically, we're going to grab one of these fillets of trout here. All right. Um, and we're just going to cut it into four pieces. These ones are nice and clean already. Man, that just looks absolutely beautiful. Now, obviously, this is uh, abundant in East Tennessee. Uh, but if I wanted to stick with another sport fish, could I use um, like a, a bluegill or a catfish yeah, or something I mean, along those lines? Yeah, for sure. Catfish would work really well. Okay. Um, I've never done it with bluegill, but I mean, a lightly, <laughs> a lightly dusted bluegill, that's, that's good. Okay. So uh, we're just going to season this with some salt and pepper. I gotcha. We're going to put it uh, back on the plate here, and we're going to brush it with a little bit of buttermilk. And so how do you conceptualize as a chef this type of a dish? Is this something that just comes to you based on the seasonality, based on uh, wanting to utilize these ingredients? Working through, okay, what, what fish can we use? Trout, right? It's perfect. So that for this dish, that comes first, right? So we know we want to use trout. We're in East Tennessee. We want to use this trout. Uh, then from there, it's what, what do we want to put with this? You know, it, it doesn't always have to be a specific thing. But let's, what do we want to eat today? Right. Um, and that's how a lot of this stuff comes about. Grapeseed oil that you're putting in and a decent amount. We're going to kind of shallow fry these. Yes, exactly. So we do want a decent amount in there. So this is perfect. Having this nice flat pan on this induction burner is perfect for this because we want we want this oil to be nice and even. You get it kind of tipping around a little bit, your pan's warped a little bit, uh, it's not gonna cook evenly. So Plus with induction, perfect. we've got just, just beautiful even heat throughout the entire pan. Exactly. Right, and so basically we're just gonna lightly press on here. Um, we don't want it to be too thick. Okay. We want a nice light breading, let that trout shine through. Yep, both sides nice and light. Okay. We've got a beautiful dredge here, the cornmeal and, and the pecans. Um, are we going skin side down or, or flesh side down? We're actually gonna go flesh side down first. Okay. That way it's in the nice clean oil and then when we go to present it later, that's the nice beautiful side. All right, I'm just gonna lay that away from cool. me. Keep everything nice and clean. I love the even heat that we're getting from this induction, man. It it's is nice. So nice. Definitely. I also like that you've cut it into portions. Like this is not something I normally do at home and I yeah. think it's so smart because it gives you a lot more control when it comes to turning and flipping the fish as well. Yep. Okay, so um, obviously this is gonna cook very, very quickly. What's yeah. one of the things we need to make sure that we're looking for? Doesn't take long. Basically, you're just gonna take a look around the edges here. Okay. Once you see those edges start to just get golden, uh, it's good. That cornmeal will get nice and crispy. You don't have to cook it too much, and it's a, such a thin piece of fish, we right. don't want it in the pan too long anyway. Two minutes, three minutes, and then flip it. Okay, and then same thing for that like beautiful crispy skin that we're, we're going for yep. on the other side. Exactly. Okay. So we're gonna grab a little bit of this watercress. We don't want the big giant stems. We just want some of the small nice pieces. We got these nice little blossoms on the end here. Our trout's good to go. Our sauce is good to go. We're gonna dress our greens, plate it up. Man, that looks nice. absolutely beautiful. All right. What's left to do? It's good to me. <laughs> Let's taste eat it. it man. Let's, Let's eat it. it. Oh, I can't wait. Oh man, that skin is just beautiful. Chef. That turned out pretty good. I you, think we did good. You've transported me to the Clinch River in East Tennessee for a fish that I did not catch. <laughs> this is an absolute home run, man. I cannot wait to serve this tonight yeah. at the cocktail party. Absolutely, me too. You know, and it's an exciting one. It's something that people haven't seen before. Familiar ingredients, but something a little bit different. I think people will love it. Oh man, it's such a great taste of home. Cheers. Thank yeah, you. Absolutely.
it's wild because I don't know that there's any other state in the union that has sort of the diverse tastes, the diverse look in terms of the, the landscape and what goes with it. It's really like three different states in many ways. And East Tennessee certainly has its own flavor in so many different areas. And um, it's fascinating. Eating a meal in East Tennessee, it, it's such a gathering time. Sure. To me, this is quintessentially East Tennessee on a plate. Yeah. Yeah. Tennessee mountain trout, Benton's ham, yeah. greens that you've picked you know, just a few yards outside yeah. of your kitchen. Mm -hmm. What is it about just the, the area and the ingredients that are inspiring you to, to drive as a chef, but also to innovate and move it forward? Well, I mean, a lot of what we do is pretty traditional. It may look different on the plate, but I mean, we're doing things, we're, we're putting flavors together that maybe you've, you've never seen on the same plate together, but it's all things that people have been doing for People have been cooking trout in East Tennessee for a long time. You've eaten fish and ham and greens mm. all at the same dinner table. Mm -hmm. We're putting them all in one dish. You see things like holding true to traditions and a unique spin to it, but then you also see in great young chefs like Trevor bringing in fresh ideas that are new to Tennessee mm -hmm. and incorporating traditional things. And I think that is what has been phenomenal to be able to go from place to place, in, especially in Middle Tennessee where I spent a bulk of my time. Um, and I think that's been special because I never would have thought Tennessee would have been what it has become. It is visibly one of the most remarkable places to live right now. When you get a plate of food here, I want you to be able to feel, like, okay, they really put some work into this. Doesn't look like it necessarily, but when you taste it, you know, okay, they took the time, they put the thought into this. And one of the things is making sure that like our staff knows and can talk to our, uh, talk to our guests and let them know kind of all of what went into it. And they can name the farm where it came from. They can talk about the process that the kitchen used to get that product out there. You don't have to go anywhere else to experience some of the best chefs and some of the best restaurants in the country. Seeing so many diverse uh, people coming here, different uh, food, different restaurants, and people just exploring that creativity and still keeping that small town, community, family feel, it's been, it's been a treat to see, man, be able to be part of that for 25 years. I think that local restaurants are really important to the fabric of a community. Chefs are artists, and restaurants give them a place to exercise their craft. I'm fortunate to live in East Tennessee. I, mm. The people that you see working for me are incredible. I wouldn't swap for anybody. I'm very fortunate to have the people around me that I've got around. I can assure you I'm humble for a reason. <laughs> I'm just a hillbilly making ham and bacon. Not every chef has the opportunity to have the farmer pick something in the morning. They bring it to you in the afternoon, they come in for dinner that night and eat it and have things be that fresh. Um, that's, I love that. That's just a cool feeling. And he's proud of his ancestry. He, he's so proud of what he's seen and what he's done. And now he's taken to the next step, you know, because he works with all the farmers, which is great, you know, so because they get what the farmer has, you know, and they're able to, like he'll say it a million times, he'll say, don't break it, it's already, it tastes good, you know, just keep it simple. Bringing all that stuff together and kind of recreating what we had on the farm, uh, that was, I, I love being able to put all those things together and come up with something that is comforting to people. Uh, some of the people that live here that say, I haven't eaten like this since I was a kid. If a 75-year-old woman says to me, these are the best collard greens I've had since I was at my grandmother's table, um, that's really special for me.
Thank you.